But let's finish out our last lecture. Vision, our last special sense. So vision is obviously extremely important. We're extremely visual creatures. We utilize uh, this frontal vision um, throughout our life. We have binocular vision. In uh, basic biology classes, you probably looked at other species of animals that were lower on the tree of life, so to speak. Um, and so, you know, having eyes focused in the front of our head means that we're, you know, at the top of our food chain. If we're worried about predation and uh, being hunted, then uh, we would have eyes more on the sides. And you see a lot of animals that are organized that way. Or, you know, there are animals like um, frogs and, you know, creatures that, um, amphibians that are half in the water, half out of the water, and their eyes are kind of on the top of their head so they can stay submerged and, and uh, uh, pay attention to visual input. Okay, so the location of our eyes is not trivial. Okay, we're, we're, we're benefiting from uh, rather acute vision, both in darkness and in light. And we'll talk about that. Now, some of these structures are going to be um, a little bit repetitive from lab, but for sake of completeness, we'll go over them. Uh, you know, we have uh, eyebrows and eyelids. We have our medial and our lateral commissures, right? These commissures are um, sort of these crossings, if you will. The conjunctiva, the conjunctiva is um, surrounding the eye and is voiced epithelium. And then we have tear production. Our tear production comes from our lacrimal apparatus, uh, specifically the lacrimal gland. The lacrimal gland is located up on the lateral aspect, superior to the eye. And every time you blink, you know, do you ever wonder why do we blink so frequently throughout the day? Okay. You blink because every time you blink, a tear runs across the eye and drains into our um, uh, duct. Right? It drains here into our lacrimal canal and into the lacrimal sac and down ultimately into this nasolacrimal duct, into the nose. So this is one of the re reasons when you cry, um, your nose starts to run because there's excess fluid that's coming into the nasolacrimal duct and it starts to drain through the nose. Okay? Alright. Um, if we look on the inner parts of the eye, that was the external anatomy, if you look at the inner parts of the eye, we organize these into tunics. Tunics are coats. Right? It's an old word that means coats or layers. So the tunics um, that we're going to go through here in a moment are going to be our tunica fibrosa, our tunica vasculosa, and our tunica interna, or our retina. But the way that we organize the rest of the eye is into two areas, optical and neural. So the eye, from a developmental standpoint, is rather impressive. And vision is quite amazing. It's probably one of the most complicated of the five special senses that we've looked at thus far. So we have an optical component that takes light information and is essentially doing what this projector is doing right here. This projector is located some certain distance away from the screen, and this screen is in focus. Right? So if I asked Carrie, I could ask her to adjust the focus of the screen so that the projected image would focus if it was right here. It would be blurry back here, but it would be in focus if I had the screen six feet forward. Or I could have her adjust the focus so that it's blurry here, and the focal point is actually six feet into the wall. And what we're all sitting in is the inside of the eye in this room. This could be a giant eye. Okay? It's gross, right? So pretend this room is like a giant eye. This is the back of the eye. That's the retina. And where the light is coming in is up there in the sound booth from the projector. This is how the eye is set up. Make sense? And there's stuff in between, but it's mostly fluid in between here and there. And all the controls that happen at the projector are adjusting the focus like our lens does. 
But it's not because of something that's coming out of the computer. It's because of something that's coming in from the other side of that wall. It allows us to see our outside environment. So our neural apparatus starts with this screen and goes that way. And our optical apparatus starts with the screen and goes all the way forward to basically where the cornea is. So our tunics are organized, like I said, into three layers. Tunica fibrosa, that made, made up of the sclera, which is the white of the eye, and the cornea. The cornea is a clear, transparent structure. The tunica vasculosa is made up of our choroid, our ciliary body, and our iris. So you can see some of the features here. Right here we've got, out here is our sclera, the white of the eye. And then we have our cornea, which is this transparent, clear, in other words, structure. Um, ciliary bodies, the ciliary bodies are found right here. And uh, they help to control the shape of the lens. We have the iris. The iris is the colored part of your eye. And it allows for... Um, the control of the amount of light that goes in and out of the eye. That's important because in bright light, you actually want to make the hole smaller. And in dark light, you want to make the hole bigger to allow as much light in as possible. Okay. An interesting fact, um, so you know the red eye? You guys, you guys have seen that when you take a picture, now your phones have this button you just push and it like takes the red out of the eyes. Sometimes it works. Other times it's like, cool, they look like zombies now because they've got like, no eyes or something. So you're like, you know, it's pretty weird. But um, the red eye is when you flash light, like from there, to the back of the screen, which is the retina, which is extremely red in color. And it's reddish colored tissue, and it reflects light back out through the opening, and your camera captures red. Now, in a lot of organisms that, that are nocturnal, like, have you ever been driving around in flag at night and you almost run into a deer or an elk? Okay? If you look at their eyes, if you capture their eyes um, uh, on camera, they, they actually, what color are they? Well, they're white or, they're, a lot of times you capture them green. It's like a, a whitish green light instead of red. And the reason is they have a reflective coating on the back of the retina that allows, right, and their eyes are more on the side of their head, and it allows for more light to be reflected inside the inner chamber here to increase their visual acuity because they, they live at nighttime, right? They operate at nighttime. They sleep mostly during the day, and they go forage for food at night, okay? So the tunica interna is our beginnings of where the neural apparatus starts, and it starts with the retina. Now, if we go to our optical apparatus, or optical, meaning vision device, the cornea, behind the cornea, we see what was called um, our aqueous humor. And we have our ciliary structures. And then we see our lens. Here's our lens right here. The lens has these suspensatory ligaments, and there's contraction or tension of the ligaments, and that causes the lens to flatten. So you can see these ligaments, which are like strings, and if you pull on them, it flattens the lens out. And if you relax them, it bulges the lens out. Okay. Here's a picture on a scanning electron microscope that gives you an idea, because this doesn't do it justice, um, this is the lens structure, and these are our suspensatory ligaments. To me, it looks like a tra Have you ever looked at a trampoline from like an aerial view? So like the trampoline in our backyard, these are these springs that attach and pull that tight. So that's kind of what you're looking at from a top-down view. Yeah? So when it flattens it, what does it do for the sight? Well, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the lens shape in just a minute, okay? So... The neural apparatus begins with the retina. And we've got a couple of features. This is a retinal scan. Now if you go into your 
uh, ophthalmologist's office, right, they will um, want to encourage you to take a retinal picture every so often. It's not, it, a lot of times it's not covered by your, your vision uh, uh, insurance, but what it does is it gives them really nice pretty pictures um, to be able to see if there's any problems. Okay? The, um, uh, the old way of doing it, the manual way of doing it, is they dilate your um, iris, they dilate your pupil, excuse me, and they put these drops in, these dilated drops. You guys have, have you ever tried this, experienced this? And then they, they look into your eye and they look with um, uh, optics, uh, a lens, to see pictures of vision, what is, look, what's going on in the backyard. What are they looking for? They're looking for um, lesions. They're looking for detachment of the optic nerve. <clears throat> They're looking for excessive vascular elements that are growing. Like this is a normal picture here. And if you see these blood vessels that kind of like all squiggle out and you know, create a pattern of blood vessels that aren't normally seen, that's going to be retinal angiogenesis that makes them very nervous. Okay. So they're looking for abnormalities in the backyard that may impact your vision. It's actually important for them to understand that information. Question? No, this isn't the glaucoma check. This is a visual. Glaucoma is uh, excessive pressure in the eye. So that's that puck test. Okay. So when you go to the eye doctor and you put your chin there, right, and they say, stay, hold still, you're going to feel a puff of air. And it's like, right, it's really weird. It like blows air in. So they're, they're, puff, they're blowing air at a certain force in your eye, and they're measuring how it bounces back to determine pressure within the eye. And then if they determine there's too much pressure in the eye, inside, then that's considered glaucoma. And the reason glaucoma is bad is if there's pressure, too much excessive pressure in the posterior chamber, that pushes on the retina, and that can cause retinal damage, and it can cause blindness. Okay? So that's glaucoma. All right, so the retina is an outgrowth of the brain. The retina is an outgrowth of the brain. So it's brain tissue that forms this screen. And on that screen is what you project the image that you're looking at. You're, you're, you're absolutely putting the picture on your brain when you open your eyes. It's kind of weird when you think about it. Right? So all of you are a picture on my brain right now. And then the occipital lobe is interpreting it. What I'm seeing, individual features, different colorations of shirt colors, different hairstyles, okay, different states of awakeness, okay. Um, the vitreous body in the back pushes the retina uh, against the rear of the eyeball. It kind of keeps it open, keeps that shape. The macula lutea houses, it's, it's really the center portion Right? And it houses what we call the fovea centralis and the optic disc. So the optic disc and the fovea centralis are located in the center region of the eye, at the back of the retina. The optic disc is the point where the optic nerve enters into the eye. If the optic disc is severed, like an injury or trauma, the patient's blind. If um, uh, this is the fovea centralis, this is a, that means uh, central focus, focus central point. So that's an area of high visual acuity, this fovea centralis. There's a high density of cones. Cones are the photoreceptors that are responsible for high visual acuity. They also give us information about color, like reds and blues and greens, but it's for visual acuity, whereas rods are for um, more general shape information. Also, information comes in black and white. Okay. So rods are, are used uh, during uh, low light levels because you're not going to be getting color information, and you have a higher opportunity to receive light activating a rod because they're more um, susceptible to low levels of light. In bright light, it's the cones. And that's why we see color in light, in bright light, and we really only see them in black and white when it's dark outside. Okay? Question. So are cones the cells that are damaged for people who are colorblind? Yeah, well, they're not necessarily damaged. They're just, uh, these, 
individuals that are colorblind are born missing certain cones. Okay, so we'll, we'll get there here in a second. And the optic nerve, the optic nerve actually takes the information from the retina to the occipital lobe. Okay, so why is there a X and a dot on the screen? So it's, it's probably not going to work on the screen. You're going to have to do it on your paper or on your device. Okay, but I'm going to give you the instructions so you can do it later. Where the optic disc is located, where the optic nerve enters the back of the retina, there's no cones or rods there because it's all nerves. So that's, that spot is actually considered a blind spot. That's what we call it. And you have one in both eyes. And so in order to find it in your left eye, you can do this. You cover your right eye, and you look at the X. Okay, stare at the X, and then you're going to move either the screen back and forward, or you can move closer and further away until the red dot disappears. You're not looking at the red dot, you're looking at the X. And right at that spot, you have to go slow. If, if, you're, kinda, if you're doing this, I can't see it, okay, it's too fast. You're literally going to have to kind of, you know, do one of these. Oh, there it is, right there. And then you kind of go back and forth, and the red dot will disappear. Okay? So that little exercise, that activity is helping you identify kind of where that image is now focusing. That image is focusing on the optic disc, on your blind spot. All right, go ahead and try it. Anybody find it? How many of you are successful finding your blind spot? Okay, cool. So you know it works. Those of you that... Some of you are like, I don't have a blind spot. I always knew I agree, but it should have been a fire pilot. <laughs> no, you have, you have a blind spot, fire pilot. Top gun. Man. All right, so you can try it at home. You can print it out uh, and do that activity. So cover your right eye. Look at the X. Okay, and move the screen or the paper back and forth slowly until the red dot disappears kind of out of your personal vision. Okay? All right, so let's talk about some of the um, mechanics. So the pupil dilates using pupil constrictors. They're circular smooth muscle. And the pupil dilator is smooth muscle that radiates out like spokes of a wheel. And changes in light intensity will alter the size of the pupil. So if it's low light, the pupil is going to open up, right? So the iris moves to the side, opening up the hole for which the light passes into this room. If it's bright light, then it reduces the size of the apparatus. It behaves much like a camera. Um, if we look over here on the right, you can kind of see some answers to the questions that were posed earlier. All right, so if I, rel oops, if I relax the ciliary muscles, right, then when they're relaxed, the ligaments go tight or taut. When they're tight, the lens itself actually thins out. Now, if I contract the ciliary muscles, now when you contract them, you see the ciliary muscles here are relaxed, here they're contracted, that actually relaxes the ligaments. So it's kind of backwards. When the ligaments are relaxed, then the lens can actually thicken out. So why do we alter the shape of the lens is the question, right? The next logical question. Why would we do that? Well, for distant vision, we actually want a thinner lens. And for close vision, we want a thicker lens. And that's just like what Carrie would do if I had a movable screen and I was playing this game with her, like, make, keep the image focused, right? I'd be like here, and I'd run up here, <laughs> right? And then I'm going, going closer, so as, clo as I go closer to her, right, she has to change the shape of the lens. As I come back, she also has to change the shape of the lens. If you don't change the shape of the lens, then the picture focus isn't going to always be in the right spot. And you can't move the retina. 
right? So you can't move the screen. So what you do is you actually change the shape of the lens to focus on the screen. And that's what we do in this classroom. It's not like we move the screen back and forth. But if you go to another classroom where they have a movable screen and they have a movable portable projector, you can see that you could either adjust the focus on the projector or you can simply grab the screen and move it back and forth. Both will work. They'll help to focus the image where you want it to focus. So what does the lens do? Well, the lens fine-tunes the image. And what happens is when light comes into the eye, it actually bends. And we call this refraction. So you're seeing in this picture these refractive indices. That's what these numbers are. So air has a refractive index of 1. That means when light passes through air, it doesn't bend. But when light passes through the lens, the refractive index is different than air. And so it changes the pathway of the light. And you can see that the cornea has a refractive index of 1.38. So it also changes or bends the light ray. And what also is important to understand is the aqueous humor, the fluid, and the cornea and the lens, they all have a refractive index that's very, very similar to each other. And so back here, we can have our vitreous body, we could have it be air. Right? We have our eyeballs filled with air. But what would happen to the light image as it came in through the cornea, 1.38, and it came through the lens, 1.40, it passed through the aqueous humor, 1.33, and then it went down to 1 if it was air. So the vitreous body is 1.33, just like the aqueous humor. So we try to have fluid in the eyeball, and you know if you did that sheep eyeball dissection, you saw that there was fluid in there, right? And you know maybe you, you put the scalpel in and it goes, right, squirt it out at you. It's kind of gross. Um, but the reason that you want fluid in there is you want to keep it open. If you had air, then you would be bending the light this way and then back. And it's after the lens has had an opportunity to focus the image. So you don't want to change the focus of the image after it passes through the lens. Make sense? All right, so the cornea bends the light, and the lens fine-tunes the bending of that light. So we actually see some lens issues. And some of you have these challenges. I do. And I can see things right now close up, and I have trouble with distant vision. And so I either have to wear glasses or contacts to see things far away. So someday, probably soon, I'll need glasses to see things close up. Okay, but so far I don't. Um, so what's going on? Well, we have some terminology. Presbyopia. Presbyopia is lens loses its flexibility. This happens as we age. Right? Why? Well. It's made out of proteins, and those proteins change in architecture as we get older. And so it doesn't have as much flexibility, just like the proteins in your skin change. And you can see that a 75-year-old skin is different than a 25-year-old skin. Same thing with a lens. Hyperopia. This is you cannot see things close up. We call this farsighted. Hyperopia is farsighted. You can't see things close up. You can only see things far away. Myopia is called nearsighted, meaning you can only see things close up, but you can't see things far away. That's what I am. So I need lenses that correct for myopia. And astigmatism means that the cornea is not shaped correctly. So it is bending the light abnormally, and the lens is receiving light that's either bent too much or bent too little. But we can correct for all these with corrective lenses. But that's why the prescription in one eye might be slightly different than the prescription in the other eye. Because you have, diff you have two different lenses, you have two different corneas, and you might have an astigmatism in one eye but not in the other, and now you know what that means. That means that the cornea on your left eye, if that's your astigmatism is, has a slightly different shape than the right eye. Okay. 
So if we look at um, these pictures, here's normal vision, and this is what I was talking about in this classroom. You guys are all sitting in here right now, right? Instead of air, it's filled with vitreous body. Isn't that going to be like you know, gel all over you? It's disgusting. And the screen is the focal plane back here, and where Carrie's sitting in the sound booth is right here, where the image is coming in. And if everything works correctly, how many of you are 2020? Raise your hand. Oh man, we just all don't like you anymore. Okay. So if you're 2020, this is what your eye looks like when it's focusing. Okay. If you're far sighted, you think you can see things far away, but you can't think, see things close up. This is what's happening is the image is actually being focused on the other side of this wall. So you could either move the retina back, which is impossible, okay, or you correct it with a convex lens that moves the focal plane closer. Okay? Now, if you're, this is my situation, if you're nearsighted, myopia, you can't see things far away, then the focal plane is... Like here, it's in front of the screen. And again, we could theoretically move the retina forward, but that's not possible. And so what we do is we correct it with a concave lens, and that pushes the focal distance back so that it's focusing on the screen or on the retina where you want the image to be seen. And then here's, here's an uh, uh, astigmatism. You can see how this cornea here is thicker than a normal cornea. So this thicker cornea is going to refract the light more aggressively than less corneal material. Question? Yes. Yep. Oh, so the question is about LASIK procedures. So the LASIK procedures, you come in and you actually alter the shape of the lens. Or in other cases, you can actually alter the shape of the cornea. So there's two different types you can do. Uh, so what happens is uh, now the lens has a greater ability to accommodate because you've altered the shape so it can fatten more or it can thin out more. Okay. Now, this is why they're not considered or guaranteed for your whole life. Later in life, as your lens continues to change, you may have to have that adjusted, or you might have to have lenses, like corrective lenses, glasses, or, or contacts. But it definitely does work. Now, what is um, um, what are cataracts? That's the last thing I wanted to talk about. Is these ways? Talk about glaucoma. What are cataracts? Anybody? Anybody know what that they are? What? Damage? No, it's not a lens or a retina. It's the cornea. Yes, deterioration of the cornea. So the cornea is made out of protein. So how many of you have headlights on your automobile that are, like, cloudy? Does that make sense? You know what I'm talking about? Like, they look, they look like they're not clear anymore. Like, you park next to a new car, and you're like, those nice headlights. And then mine are, like, all, like, yellow and cloudy. And, you know, they look dirty, right? So the UV light is... Um, cross-linking and denaturing the polymer in your headlight because it's plastic. If it was glass headlights like the old days, they wouldn't change color, just so you know. But because they're a plastic polymer, they get denatured or cross-linked by UV radiation. Okay? And so if you're not covering your car when it's parked outside all day long, over years, the polymer denatures and it becomes cloudy. That's exactly what happens with cataracts. Is the cornea, the protein in your eye, cornea, denatures over time and you get these cloudy spots like those headlight cloudy spots on your automobile. And we'll go in and we'll remove them. And then the vision will be improved. Okay, cataract removal. All right. Um, Physiology-wise, we have uh, just a couple of slides to explain this. Very straightforward. Okay. This looks like a mess. I get it. Okay. But here, in orientation, here's the direction of light coming in. 
This is the back of the eye. Okay, so this is the tissue here is all part of the retina. And all of these cells are located in the retina. What I want you to appreciate is the light comes in and it passes through all of the cells. And it shines back here where you've got your rods and you have your cones. They're called rods because these guys look like rods and these guys look like cones. See the little cone structure? And when these guys are stimulated, or what we call photo bleach, when light hits them, it bleaches this pigment. And when the pigment gets bleached, it changes a conformational shape. And that changing a conformational shape triggers an action potential. That's it. Now, you have different types of rods, and you only have, you have three different types, and you only have one type of, of cone. Um, the pigment epithelium is located at the very back, and once you stimulate these guys, you send a signal, you see the synapse? You send a signal onto these bipolar cells. So these are the first order neurons. I'm sorry, these are the first order neurons. These are the second order neurons. These are the ganglion cells. And those guys synapse to the optic nerve. So the visual light comes past the optic nerve, like waves as it goes by. It passes by the ganglion cells, past the bipolar cells, and then activates your photoreceptors. And then the signal re reverses and is sent electrically this way to the optic nerve. Make sense? So the photoreceptors, the cones, you have about six and a half million cones for color. You have about 130 million rods. And all of these converge on a limited number of bipolar cells. So you can see there's more here and then there's fewer here. So you kind of converge down the signal. Remember when we talked about converging circuits? <clears throat> so all of this is sending a signal to the optic nerve. Well, th that doesn't really tell me how the signal gets transmitted. How do you get color information versus black and white? Okay, so here's a picture of a rod. This is a real picture. Here's a picture of a cone. Looks like it, doesn't it? Now, the rods, there's only one type, and we have a protein called opsin. And it has a certain type of configuration. And this retinol, retinol is a, de a derivative from vitamin A. So uh, carrots are high in vitamin A, and that's why mom said eat your carrots and give you better vision. Okay, so that's where vitamin A comes from in our diet. One source is from carrots. And so that's why that wives tale of you know, eating carrots gives you better vision. Well, there's all sorts of other great vitamins in it too. Um, but that's probably correct, developmentally. Okay, you can probably stop eating carrots now because you have all the, you know, retinol that you need. But don't tell mom I said that, okay? The cones have a photopsin. So it's rhodopsin is our photosensitive protein in rods. And photopsin is the photosensitive protein in cones. There are three types of cones. Red, blue, and green. The problem is... If you lack one of these guys, blue or green, as the question was earlier, is you only have two of the three, then different shades of like blue and green will all look the same, because you can't differentiate. So between red, blue, and green, you can get all the visual colors of the spectrum. Right? Remember back to your art classes. These are our primary colors, right? So the other thing is, um, in the old television sets, that you could, you know, you could take apart these old TVs. The, the ones that were kind of fun to take apart were the projection TVs. You guys remember the projection TVs? So in the old days, like in the 80s, the projection TVs were actually cylinders that were red, blue, and green, and they would actually fire from the ground or from up top, and they would form the color image on the screen. That's exactly what's happening in your eye. And on the old tube televisions, if you got, if, while it was on, if you got really close to the screen and you looked, you would see pixelations of three dots. If you have an old tube television that's still working, you would go visit mom and dad over the summer. And if they have an old tube TV, you get up to the screen and look and you'll see a red, a blue, and a green dot all together. And that's full, the TV is full of that. Okay, that's how it used to work. It doesn't work that way anymore. Well, you can see what these cells look like 
We've got these outer segments, we have an inner segment, um, and they're just cell nuclei, right? Individual cells. So how does the photopigmentation work? This is our last slide. Stay with me, guys. We either have a dark cycle where there's no photo signal. Does that make sense? A dark cycle. There's no, there's no photo signal. And then we have, when you have light hitting the protein, that would be when you're detecting a signal. So in the dark situation where there's no signal, we have the format of our photosensitive protein in a cis format. Do you remember cis and trans from chemistry? So in a cis format here, this has the ability to be absorbing light, and when light hits this opsin protein, it isomerizes this cis to a trans form. So it goes from this crooked form to this straight form. That conformational change triggers an action potential. Okay? And this is called photo bleaching. And then here is the action potential being triggered using a cascade that breaks down cyclic guanosine monophosphate. When it's done sending the signal, the transretinal separates from the opsin. Okay? It's enzymatically converted back to a cisretinal form. And now it's reabsorbed into opsin and it's ready to be used again. And so that's one of the reasons if you get a bright flash of light, right, you kind of go blind for a period of time until things reset. Do you know what I'm talking about? So if somebody takes your picture, you're not expecting, it's like, Shh, right, and you're like, I can't see. You have to wait for the transform to come back to the cis form. Okay, so photo bleaching is how we see. Questions over that? All right, stay with me. We have Simus to pick up.